Hello everyone, this is Remlays from 40k Theories, and welcome to this newest episode of Adeptus Podcasters. Joining me as always is Tactica Imperialis. Hello everyone. And joining us as our special guest this week, coming to us straight from the depths of the Black Library, the author of the novels Hellbrecht and Void King, Mark Collins. Hi, good to be here. Yeah, thank you for coming on. Yeah, no problem. Uh, so, uh, before we delve into things like the news and stuff, um, do you want to talk about any particular upcoming projects that you may have for us in the works, if you're actually able to divulge such information? Uh, nothing that I can talk about. Um, I've just had um, The Emperor's Finest, the new collection, come out, so uh, on war. So it's a brand new story in The Emperor's Finest, and it's two reprints of E-Shorts in Only War, which is Ghosts of Iron and The Shapers of Scars. I do have more things that are in the works. Um, something else long form that's coming out probably next year, and hopefully another short that's out before the end of the year. Keep yourself busy, don't you? It's It's been, yeah, pretty much non-stop. Uh, it's, it's impressive, and it's always interesting talking to different authors about uh, different people's work rates, work et- not work ethics the wrong word, but the way they approach projects. Some people will sit down and write super quickly. Some people take it uh, a little bit at a time and thus have a bit more of a spread at release schedule. It's always interesting to get different takes on how to tackle the writing process. Yeah, for me, um, it was... A bit slower at first. Um, I had the first short story, and when I finished that, it was sort of a case of, do you have any other ideas? Pitch something else, and then it was a few months before I heard anything back about any future projects. And it was while working on that, the sort of approached me about doing a novel. And the first one I actually wrote was Void King. Um, it just kind of got lost in the release schedule after COVID kicked in. Mm-hmm. Um, so I kind of went straight from that into Grim Repast, into Hellbrecht, and then on and on it goes. So I've been very lucky in that regard, just in terms of having the opportunities. But I think I'm more of a kind of chipping away a little bit at a time kind of person. That's fair. Uh, it's, it's also uh, interesting because obviously Grim Repast was one of, I don't know if it was the first Warhammer crime novel, but certainly one of the very first. How much sort of brief were you given for that in terms of, the, you've got Varangantua and everything's set around Varangantua as I understand it in terms of with having Quill and Drask as your character you kind of had the chance to shape the setting almost to your own whims in many ways No, absolutely um, so Grimmer Pass was actually the third crime novel that came out but oh God, oh God, I've lost count, sorry <laughs> It was, yeah, it was Bloodlines in Flesh and Steel then Grimmer Pass um, but what had happened was Bloodlines was already written one of the first shorts, which was Cold Cases ah. in No Good Men. So I was given sort of almost like a, a Bible, essentially, you know, like in terms of, you know, like background lore specifically on Varen Gantua. So it had all the terminology, the things that are usually in the glossaries at the back of them. Yeah. And other than that, I had, did have a bit more freedom. So uh, Polaris, which is the district that Grim Repast and Cold Cases takes place in, is this sort of like southern snowy icy district with like sort of lashings of edinburgh really um and i got to sort of shape that from the ground up and what was really interesting was by the time you get to i think it was sanction and sin one of the later anthologies someone else right. had just set a story in polaris did they actually consult with you on how to write it? Is there anything that they could... Obviously, you don't have to share the whole process, but I know from talking with other authors, they often will, if they're working on a character someone else wrote, will often say, oh, how would you write this? Or um, how does this work? Or what's this... Can I say this about them? And would that canon clash with you? Um, I don't know. Um, we weren't actually in conversation at the time. Um, it's sort of, sort of more of a... A pleasant surprise, but um, since then I have sort of talked to other authors and we do sort of like go back and forth and share ideas and information about Baron Gantu and sort of the wider setting as well, just to kind of, if anyone has a query, there's sort of a, an open ear that you can listen to or talk to. Right, yes, I'm with you, I'm with you. Sorry, I don't mean this to come across like we're just doing an interview. Uh, I know yeah, that's yeah, not that's what you really signed up for. <laughs> um, I guess there's just only one thing that I had left was writing crime versus writing mainline if you will because crime when you think of crime i often think of noir novels and things like that which has a very different tone it's it's mysterious absolutely but it's also a bit 
and quite tongue in cheek, but not on the same way that 40k's grimdark is. And it's a stark contrast to typical shooty you... shooty bang bang alien go bleh. <laughs> Absolutely. So, <laughs> how do you sort of take a a 40k setting and apply a completely different direction to it? Uh, especially coming from something like Hellbrecht, where you're writing about one of the most shooty shooty bang bang alien go Blair characters, to writing a, a novel that's set very much more slow paced, investigatory, very very little violence by comparison. There's, I mean, it's definitely a, a sort of shift in gears, but I think that there's been enough kind of already done that for me as a reader and a writer, um, I was able to sort of approach it with sort of one eye on history because we've had, you know, obviously we've had Eisenhorn and we've had a lot of the later books like um, Chris Wright's Vaults of Terror books. They've sort of codified what people think of as like domestic 40k and that was the thing that always people always talked about Eisenhorn, they talked about mm-hmm. domestic 40k and I think that's the sort of the vein that crime is mining and I think it's it's just crazy when you look at like when I first started reading Bloodlines and they've got that, that sort of the start off where like the girl goes to the club and all that sort of thing and there's like someone just with green skin and it's got this very kind of like Blade Runner cyberpunk kind of vibe to it but at the same time it's still got that 40k feel. There was a part in the, um, the sort of writing of Grim Repast where I think it lent a little bit too much into the sort of megacorp feel of certain parts of it and had to kind of go back and it's not enough to sort of just like put skulls on the top of it and like pile on the gilding it's like you've got to kind of look at it as like mercantile concerns in 40k are going to be like you know the east india company on crack basically and it's just sort of leaning more into that rather than like it can't all be you know glass pyramids and fire like it is in blade runner so i think it's like finding that kind of that sort of middle ground and making sure it still feels 40k and there's what like parts of that novel that you couldn't really do if it wasn't 40k yeah i'm with you i'm with you and certainly if you've come from a place like as you say like blade runner or for the younger generation games like cyberpunk um 2077 you've got a perception of what that sort of dystopia is like but 40k is another kind of dystopia so i do see what you're saying there um and I don't know when the next Black Library um, submissions contest is, but I hope that uh, if anyone's listening and thinking of entering, that that's given you some ideas uh, as of how you might shape your work. Um, don't steal, but uh, the best artists borrow. So, uh, absolutely. Oops, sorry. I think, I think the correct term is it's anyway. paying homage. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> and 40K is exceptionally good at doing that. <laughs> yes, it is. How did you get into the hobby? Uh, do you actually have time to hobby at home, or have you come in uh, as an author coming in, or have you come in more as a hobbyist who's turned author? Um, I'm definitely more of a, a reader who's turned author. Um, I do have a small pile of shame that is growing. Don't we all? Um, <laughs> I've Don't got, we all? Yeah, mine's is still very junior. I've got like the Black Templars box that I need to start putting together. Um, mm-hmm. I've got Cursed City, and I got blackstone fortress and a whole bunch of the add-ons and i've been getting the the warhammer plus models and like i pop into um, my local gw and like look at the books and then occasionally pick up a paint like a paint or a pin badge that's, that's probably about it and slowly building up the collection of paint and tools so i really do need to crack in it but i kind of started out as like a as a failed hobbyist essentially i had a friend in high school who basically just kept lending me codexes because he wanted me to start collecting an army and I've read them and I'm thinking this background is fantastic I absolutely love this but I can't do this looking at the big bits at the back where I had all the pictures like I can't paint and assemble these uh, um, but I've sort of since kind of worked up my, my courage and I've done some painting and stuff at uh, Games Workshop Glasgow so it's in the future but definitely um, a reader first um, and I think like the first thing I read was Eisenhorn and then I just sort of went mad for um, just getting my hands on whatever I could. Sounds good. Was the Black Templars army inspired by writing Hellbrecht, or was it Black Templars first? <laughs> just it curious, was, since it came up. It was Black Templars first. Um, I've always loved them. Um, I had the old, what was it, third, fourth edition codex, yeah. when they still had their own, yeah, when they still had their own codex. 
and it was just one of like the best things that I'd read like going through that and just seeing how different they were and just how unique and how they really went into the the zealotry and the sort of the like space night um so when I wrote Trophy Maker's Kingdom in the long vigil I'd put in a Black Templar and that sort of led to writing some more Black Templar stuff so I wrote Champions All um, and then that sort of led eventually in a sort of roundabout way into Helbrecht and there's a Black Templar in the Emperor's Finest story yeah that's uh that's a very comprehensive uh so it must have been a bit of a, a a dream pitch of wait i get to write about the guy who basically has been my main character in not inspiration that's the wrong word but your army's main character gets to be your one of your big frontline novels in a character series I, that must have been like either pitching that or getting that brief must have been a bit of a dream i guess it was it was pretty amazing. It was also incredibly terrifying. <laughs> yeah, I can see that too. The intimidation of oh shit, I've got to be the definitive Hellbrecht author now. <laughs> yeah, it's like you've got to write the definitive novel about the character in a series that's literally set up for just that. But then also, like, there's the 40k fandom, and then there's the Black Templars fandom. So it's like, mm. if, if, mm. if if I if I annoy them, I'll probably get set on fire. Literally. <laughs> Sadly, to, to be honest, I don't think you'd be the only one they'd like to set on fire. Uh, but we'll uh, leave that one there for another day. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, so apologies, by the way, obviously with Remley's being off last episode that you had to put up with listening to me for much longer than usual. Uh, but okay, and I'm sure you've noticed Rem's voice is mostly, if not entirely, back up to scratch. So uh, it won't just be listening to me for another two yeah, hours. Um- I also want to apologise if my voice sounds a bit off, because not only am I still dealing with COVID, but I'm also recording from a brand new location. Basically, like, while I've been in my downtime, I've been converting a corner in my u- utility room in the house into, like, a makeshift, well, a makeshift office area. So I've started putting, up, like, you know, insulating noise foam and stuff like that. So I don't know if it sounds weird or anything like that. Uh, you know. No, it sounds good to me. Hey. That sounds all right. Hooray! <laughs> It wasn't all. It's usually me that gets told off for their audio anyway, so. It just means my efforts weren't all in vain, because I've got like this, um. I've actually got a desk now! Holy crap! <laughs> <laughs> uh, as opposed to just a dining, t- like a dinner tray, which I balanced the mic and laptop on. Yeah, Bush League, I know. Um, but I've got this big can of spray adhesive, which I'm using to like stick the foam on the wall, because the foam does not want to stay up. <laughs> it keeps falling down. Have you tried? Uh, have you tried consulting your local? Uh, oh no, I can't come up with a bloody heresy slash blessing of construction joke. Damn it! Should have thought that ah. before I said it. Never mind. But that brings us to a very stupid point of imperial law, where load bearing walls were considered heretical. Let us never forget that. <laughs> that was Aaron, wasn't it? Who wrote that? No, David Adendale. Yeah. Yeah, it was in um, Death Antagonist, yeah. Death of Antagonist, oh, yeah. yeah. God, that good was... Good novel, uh, that, that was... Mm, it was a good novel, just had one particularly stupid thing in it. Just uh, like most of 40 let's be honest. Remember... Yeah, It's inherently true. silly, let's be honest. Uh, and that's why yeah. we love it. Uh, and it's be... <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to keep you in your No, it's fine. But to be fair, speaking of silly... Uh, well, we're on about books and law. Um, Black Library have started their season of horror with a new set of Warhammer horror titles and also revealed some of their uh, Christmas lineup, their Christmas releases, including Only War is mentioned here, uh, which we were talking a little bit about earlier. I think um, that actually went on, the... on sale today, I think. Did it? I think so. Oh, right. Sorry. My perception is... Oh, yeah. It does say it right down at the very bottom of the paragraph. Dang it. I only know it's because I um, ordered the Shadow Sun novel on pre-order today and I saw it in the pre-order section, so... Yes, um, we're going to talk about that in a few episodes, I hope. Of course. Absolutely. Uh, Mm. But the silly novel is The Gobbo's Demise, uh, a Red Gobbo story once again. Um, Hooray! So, yes, takes charge of a bunch of girls after the death of the run hurt. (laughs) Uh, Well, we'll see what happens. Is it it Mike Brooks again writing this one? No, it's Denny Flowers writing this oh. one. Oh, okay. Yes, it's a, a change of author um, from Mike Brooks. I think he's kind of fitting that the gobble flits about, you know, given that the role moves around. Mm. Yeah, I mean, true. Would you ever want to write a red gobble story, Mark? 
Um, I wouldn't say no. <laughs> Is there any brief you would you... say no to? Ooh. That's a tough one, actually. Um, because I love asking an author, is there a brief of like, I really want to see this, but also I really, really don't want to write it because either I'll get it wrong or I want to see what someone else does with it. Ooh. Mm. I don't know, maybe not like... Mm, maybe not like the Ultramarines. Fair. I think I like sort of chapters that are a bit madder, like the Templars, just somebody who's off to one side. Um and just gets to do really crazy things. You would get on very well with the Space Wolves. <laughs> ah, I'd love to write the Space Wolves. I do have one question, though. Um, I don't know if you're actually able to disclose this or anything, but um, speaking of uh, Vikings who hold grudges, are, are there any plans in the works for Leagues of Votan novels, do you know? I haven't heard anything. Um, that would be very fun to do. I think there's a lot of just nice little jumping-off points with the background. I think yeah. probably safer hands than me to do like the initial ones, just like setting everything up. But like, if there was a few like down the line, because all the stuff about the Mad Core just keeps bouncing around in my head. That could be a fun novel. Like the Mad Core, you could get get some real like System Shock Two Showdown kind of vibes from it, kind of thing. Oh yeah, definitely. Oh, sorry, you've lost me completely. Oh, you know, play System no, Shock. In, I... No. What? I know it's the I know it's like the ancestor to Bioshock. I'm aware of that it exists, but I have never played it. Okay, Tag. Oh, when you're we, missing out. Yeah, when we when we finish this, you're gonna go to like GOG.com and buy System Shock. It's like like a five or something. So, uh, no, <laughs> respectfully, coward. no, not coward. Or I don't have time. I'm literally drowning in mock exam papers right now. Uh, literally, if you look around, if I look around my room, I've been given about. 100 mock exam papers to mark for next week so if you'll excuse oh, me on that one i am a little bit busy to just knock around and bob about playing video well, games well you on can this play week. it over the christmas holiday then maybe <laughs> there you go maybe you still need to watch akira <laughs> you don't watch akira oh, why am i being bullied <laughs> uh, i need to make oh, up well. for the last ep- for the last episode so i'm sorry that's fine. <laughs> uh, right. So, uh, staying with Silly one more time, the most recent article on Warhammer Community at the time of recording is this year's, um, well, it's commemorative miniature. It's not a Christmas miniature this year per se. They have done a model for a goth rocker, and it looks awesome. I always appreciate the old Rogue Trader throwbacks. It does look very fun. Hmm. I just want to get that and the um, the noise marine one they did a few years ago, and just like have them, you know, form a band. A, a play We're halfway yeah. now. We've got the lead singer and lead guitar. We've got your bass with the Emperor's Children, so we're halfway there. Just need a drummer now. Hmm. Oh, wasn't it actually in Rotary? Wasn't it like um, an Eldar model that had like basically a keytar? You da- I don't know. I wasn't born. <laughs> um, imagine like, like noise marine bass player, goth rocker, singer, guitarist, Eldari keyboard player, and she needs someone on the drums. I don't know, like a Votan drummer. Yeah, I'm sure they could come up with someone with a drum. I mean, the Orcs use enough drums, so I think the Scots could do drums quite well, like a big industrial set <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> Be literal oil drums or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> But no, the Goth Rocker miniature is awesome. Uh, it's got a stick bomb style microphone, an amp squig, uh, a guitar that probably works as a shooter because, well, of course it probably does. Um, and there will be a festive music video, uh, oh, which will God. be streaming on Spotify and Apple Music as well. Amazing. <laughs> so oh, we is it going to be like, ha- um, like the 12 Days of Nurgle? <laughs> we had that one. Maybe. Yeah. I remember that I was 2018, I think it was. Yeah. Uh, they did that. That was back um, when Duncan was with the company. Yeah, that was a while back now. But uh, yes, it's going to be a thing. Uh, maybe, who knows, we'll get a Christmas number one out of an orc. That would be hilarious, but I, I, I'm, I'm hoping against hope. <sighs> right, I'm out of silly things to talk about now. Uh, uh, so I, think we did, should... I don't know if you uh, mentioned it last episode, but they did update the Black Library coming soon page. 
Um, no, we didn't. Uh, did you not watch it? Well, I've been ill, Tag. You edited it, though. <laughs> very, very briefly. I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> I was more concerned about getting the noise levels right, level and balanced more than anything else. Fair enough. All right, I'll let you off. Yeah. No bully. So no, what's on the coming <laughs> soon page? <laughs> right, so uh, for Age of Sigma in November, we have the paperback editions of Kragnos Avatar of Destruction and Hallowed Ground. For yeah, 40k, uh, that's... Not bad. Um, we have Empress Fires, which is actually on pre-order now. Um, the Victory Part 2, which is a Gaunt's, Go- Gaunt's Ghost Omnibus. I don't know why I said that twice. My mind's gone frazzled. Um, but that includes the novels Warmaster and the Anarch, which are the two most recent mm-hmm. ones. Um, we're getting Witchbringer, the Astro Militarum novel focusing on a Primaris Psyker. Yes, I remember seeing that get previewed a few weeks or months ago. So, yes, mm. I, that sounds familiar to me. It's Looking nice to have a more or less concrete, well, a, a window for release. Um, Krieg is coming out on paperback, as is the second Soul Drinkers omnibus, which includes Chapter War, Hellforged, Phalanx, and the novella Deniathos. And I do recommend Deniathos, the novella, because it's so what the actual fuck is going on kind of thing. <laughs> Uh, fun fact, it actually has one of the most interesting quote-unquote creation myths regarding the Space Marines. So, oh, there was 20 Primarchs, but two got killed, and they were chopped up and turned into gene seed for which created Space Marines. <laughs> it's like, wait, what? <laughs> it's certainly a take, but it's an interesting one for like an in-universe creation myth. Um, we're also getting the special edition for Cadian Blood, which is covered in fabric, and so it's going to be absolutely horrible to hold in your hands. I'm sorry. Oh, lovely. Um, also, Shadow Sun, the Patient Hunter, which is on pre-order today. Um, it's probably, well, out of print, but, well, out, out of stock, rather. Not out of print. Out probably, of stock. yeah. And for Horus Heresy, we're getting Sanguinius the Great Angel, both on standard and special edition release this month as well. Okay. Nice. So I'm still upset from the um the synopsis because it doesn't tie into that story where the silent king met with sanguinius allegedly it's like i want to touch more on that this is the perfect opportunity this was the perfect opportunity to expand on that one little lore tip bit like sanguinius and the silent king having a conversation that would have been awesome but yeah round over (laughs) it's one of the it's one of those that probably was thrown in as a bit of a throwaway of uh Oh, look how interesting and mysterious and how ancient the Silent King is, rather than a, we actually want to talk about this someday because it will just bend everybody's brain. Mm. Maybe one day we'll get an expansion on it. I did like that they went back and kind of... I do like that they kind of went back and like looked at that, though, when they did like Word of the Silent King that Laurie Golding wrote, I'm sure. Yeah. Like they did a wee short story and it had the whole, oh, he's wearing Zingwini's his face. Yeah, that's the one, yeah. Yeah, good times. Yeah. What else we got in the news tag? We have tanks mostly. Um, well, mm. tanks and cavalry. Um, so since we've got a Black Templar on the program, why not start with something named after their founder, the new Astra Militarum Rogal Dawn tank? I hate that name for the tank. I'm sorry. I, <laughs> I read it and immediately just went. <laughs> I know we found we know we just taken the Lehman Russ as a name and accepted it, but the fact that they've done it a second time and called it the Rogal Dawn, I just I just laughed. I'm sorry, I just laughed. Personally, personally, I would have preferred it if it was named the Praetorian. That would be good. That would have been good. Or, or even just like name it after like I mean I don't know much of the law behind the tank because obviously the new guard codex ain't out yet, um, but. If it was like just named after a great hero, why not name it after Ursa Car Creed? You know, the Lord Castellan himself. You know, he'd be worthy to name a tank after, I reckon. Probably, yes. Yeah. But again, I don't know the law, so I don't know if like it was something that the Imperial Fists found the STC for. If that was the case, I can understand why it named it the Rogal Dawn. Um, yeah. I mean, in terms of how it works compared to Lehman Russ, uh, the Lehman Russ, I should say, it's sort of a halfway house between the Russ and the Bane Blade. Uh, with toughness 9, yeah. 17 wounds, a 2 up armor save, uh, strength 8 for when it runs people over, um, but this is skill 4+, plus, so it's no more accurate, 
Um, but it comes with, well, one of its options, the Oppressor Cannon is 90 inch range strength 10 ap minus so, 3 sorry sorry 90 90 90 jesus fuck well the lehman <laughs> rust gun is 72 so yeah it outranges it by a bit it's heavy d6 plus 3 with blast so it's a guaranteed nine shots against big units or a guaranteed six shots against a five man squad Strength 10, AP minus 3, which is a bit puny, but damage 4. To put that in context, that is a... It's not quite a 2-tap on killing Gilliman, but it's a 2-tap against pretty much everything else, and against a single monstrous creature, we'll be wounding it on 3s, mostly ignoring its armor save, and if it gets 3 wounds through, which it has a good chance of doing, is a 1-shot. So... It's a pretty powerful gun, and it's a turret weapon, which says, this is for the Lehman Russ as well, tank turrets can target any enemies they want, even while locked in melee, so they can just shoot out of combat with the turret, and also adds plus one to their hit roll as a bonus, so the turret gun gets a three up to hit. Well then. Yeah. Now the Russ <laughs> and the um, Dawn have that, and I'm sure the Bane Blades cannon will as well. Uh, the Bane Blade, by the way, now has toughness nine and thirty wounds. Just for context. Thirty. Thirty. Um, so yes, it just that's 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 what the uh, modern system of 40k has done. <laughs> is that instead of tanks having like you know, I remember the days where four or five hull points was ridiculous, um, but now it's thirty wounds because of the way the wound system versus the hull points and the armor value system works. Because tanks behave like monsters and have to be incredibly tanky. The wound stat and the toughness stat just goes up to ludicrosity. A tank being tanky, say it ain't so. I know. <laughs> I still remember the days of armor penetration rolls, you know, like, oh this vehicle had an armor value of twenty on the side, but like fifteen on the back, whatever. And if you print out the arm, mate, roll a on a table, hey, congratulations on six, you just killed it. That was 7th edition, Remlays. Well, with the armor penetration rolls of like D6 plus 4 plus D10 plus D3. No, not that, but uh, but the, sim the streamlined armor penetration system of strength plus D6 versus armor value rolled on table, that's, that's all the way up to 7th. It was only 8th they got rid of that. I know, it's, it's like reminiscing about second edition's craziness. I understand why. Because uh, no. I'm old. <laughs> but no, it's it's a thing. Uh, there is no law. I've actually had a read of both articles about it, um, and neither of them make mention as to why it's named after Dawn. I think, it, well, this is from a, a supposed leak, so take it with a pinch of salt, you know, or a mountain of salt in this case, rather. Mm -hmm. But supposedly... The law reason is that the tanks were in use on Terra, which is why they got the Rogal Dawn name, the you know, Praetorian of Terra, mm -hmm. and they were basically used by the Terran regiments such as the Lucifer Blacks. And Gilman basically saw that and said, Why isn't the rest of the Astro Militarum using this? I mean, if that's true, fair enough. I mean it's nice that it's not just another grav tank made by Belisarius Call. That's a nice change. True. But if that's true, that does paint a kind of an incompetent picture of the guard. Um, it's the Imperium. Yeah, yeah. okay, I'll we'll prove it. <laughs> oh, okay, this better not be true. Apparently, Yarrick was killed off screen, he just died of old age. Just like, no. what? They had better, if they've done that, then that is going to really wind people up. Because that's yeah, again, just... Again, take this all with a pinch of salt, you know, this may not be true. This is basically from quote-unquote leaks. Quote-unquote. So, but if that's true, if that's true, oh, Jesus... Because, considering that, you know, the whole gasgol yarrick rivalry has been a thing since, like, you know, the early 90s, if they were going to kill Yarrick off, just have Gazgol kill him off, end their rivalry? Yeah, like, yeah, I think just finally have it be Gazgol wins fatality and be done with it. Yeah, one has to kill the other. There's, like, there's no other way to have it. I, I like to think, if that is true, maybe it's, like, 
They're just trying to lull the orcs into a false sense of security. Guys go finally get to the cockpit and then Yag surprised. just comes out of nowhere. Boom! Sucker punch. Yeah, I mean, you could see with Psyche Awakening, they tried to give Gazgul somebody else to fight with Ragnar Blackmane, and nobody bought it, and nobody cared. Like Apparently it was actually a reference to like an old Ragnar Blackmane story where the two actually fought, supposedly. Um, I don't know the story in question, so don't no, quote me. No, me neither. But, but if it is actually a reference to an old story, okay, fair enough, I can see the justification. Fine. Just- uh, if that's the case, I'll let them off. Gazgul's just one of those guys who collects like nemeses like their Pokemon. Yeah, I mean Ragnar, I choose you. <laughs> True. <laughs> Though I think the ludicrous uh model and or law of the week, uh I can't believe I'm saying this, goes to the guard as well for their new Lord Commander Solar, Leontus. Ah yes, Alexander the Great, but not the cool Macarius version. Yes. <laughs> so Arcadian Leontus is Lord Commander Solar, and he's on a horse. A, a pretty much entirely cybernetic horse, but still a horse. Did you see Kyrios' video regarding it saying how the Lord Solar is actually the horse? Um, I saw Kyrios had made a video saying how much he loved the model, but I don't remember him saying exactly that. Yeah, he did a separate video basically like quote unquote proving how the horse itself is the Lord Commander Solar Uh, of course I mean to be fair I'm taking the proverbial out of the model a little bit but I actually do quite like it and as much as it's not a very 40k-ish thing guy on sword guy on horse with sword I get that right yeah yeah yeah, all right all right I realized what I did guy on horse with sword um I do actually quite like what they've done with it. The pose is good. It fits for a commander. But I actually really like the poses in on the limited edition cover of the Codex revealed at the bottom of the article as well. Um, what I really want to do with it, though, is I want to see a Cities of Sigma players get their hands on it and turn it into a free guild general on like a clockwork horse. Mm. That would be very cool. Um, that's what I really want done with it. In terms of what he does in game... Uh, he's got uh, a power sword. He's got a pistol of some kind. I'm assuming it's either plasma uh, or volkite or something because it's soul's righteous gaze. It's not going to be a bloody bolt pistol. It could be an archaeotech pistol. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but what's really clever and what um, he's sort of taking up, as much as we've got the new creed, Ursula Creed, he's sort of the supreme commander. So he's got the access to the tarot readers. Uh, who read the Emperor's Tarot, the Collegiate Astrolex. I think that's a new name for them. Um, Mm -hmm. And what he does in game is you can change one of your objectives once you know what your opponents are. So Mm -hmm. if your opponent is... So you set up before the game, you pick what your agendas and secondary objectives are going to be. More experienced 40k players will understand what that means better than I do. Um... You pick your secondaries, what you want to do with the game. You then see what your opponent is doing and go, actually, if they're doing that, I should do this instead because that will allow me to get a better advantage, allowing you to swap it out and mulligan, if you will, one of your things for another one. If you don't do this, then you just get an extra command point, uh, which, again, is very useful for a lot of different things. And I'm sure with the order system and everything, the guard will get a lot of use out of having additional command points. Hmm. Also, can we talk about the fact he's got a tactical ta- a tactical knight? Yeah, tactical rock is evolving. <laughs> More Pokemon jokes. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, 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 that's fine. Uh, but no. I, I like it. I think, it like, is a nice model. I think it's just nice that they're going to like put that out, they're going to put the Rough Riders out, and people are just going to build like a horse army, like full mm. cavalry guard unit. Just charge right over everyone else. Yeah, and to be fair, I just know sorry. I just know there's gonna be someone out there who's gonna convert the Rough Riders and this and um, just put space and have like, you know, white scar Rough Riders. <laughs> yes. You know someone's gonna do it. Or even just swap the Rough Riders heads out and make them like Chagorian riders from the days of Jagatai Khan and put them in their heresy army and do them as count as bikers. Oh, that'd be cool. 
uh, to mm. represent like Trigorian cavalry from the days before. But either way, the guard army is looking really good. And I have to say, they've really done a good job of updating and redesigning the guard. We talked a lot last episode about the new army set with the new heavy weapons and uh, the new um, Cadian shock troops and everything like that. And the guard range is looking really good overall. So I hope that uh, longtime guard veterans are looking forward to the new range release. I know I would, if I wasn't a million armies deep already, uh, be very interested in it. Mm. Hmm. Where to next? Spice. Um, if we're doing that then, let's talk about the lizards from space because there's a new Warcry box. Oh yeah, with the chameleon skinks. That was a lovely segue. So yes, this is Sundered Fate. Uh, jumping across to the Mortal Realms now, a Warcry box uh, pitting a chameleon skink warband, the hunters of Quan Chi. I probably completely butchered that pronunciation. Quan Chi? Quan, not Quan. I was just saying, I was like, we're getting a Mortal Kombat crossover now, are we? No, it's with a H, yeah. not a Q. Um, right. <laughs> but no, yes, Chameleon Skink Warband, Blowpipes, Clubs and Shields, Hornblower, Spear Chieftain, that kind of thing. Um, and it will also be joined by Terror Wings, which are kind of uh, an update on the uh, Terrorax Riders. Uh, that you used to have back in original Lizardmen, the Pterodons, sorry. They're sort of similar to the Pterodons uh, from old school Lizardmen. Mm. On the uh, other side are the Jade Obelisk. Um, essentially a cult of Zinch that don't know they're a cult of Zinch. Um, and they are slowly turning into stone, uh, feeding their altars um, who carry around their monuments and have a bird-like speaker. Uh, this is where the whole Zinch thing comes from. And to be fair, these guys look really quite cool um, with their jade armor, partly stone skin, the masks, the chisels and hammers. I really like the look of this warband a lot. I think they look really cool. Yeah, it's just a really nice aesthetic. And the sort of the segmented armor plates as well. Mm. Yeah, definitely. I'm... Um, I'm not sure what style of armor it is where they've got the almost like spiked studs over their hoods and off the shoulders and things like that. It reminds me of, I know some of the armor. That's the word I'm looking for. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, I get real, I can't, I'm going to use this phrase. I get real Skyrim vibes from them mm. in many ways. I don't know why. You have no idea how much, Effort it's taken for me not to make an arrow to the knee joke right now. <laughs> no, it'd be a blowpipe dart in this case. But yes, they are a thing, and Warcry is just continuing to produce amazing models. I don't think I've seen a single warband that is a miss in Warcry, or Underworlds for that matter. The AOS team in miniatures just keep knocking it out of the park with their specialist game miniatures every single time. It's nice that they've got that little kind of like like sand pit essentially to just go we want to do a really cool army that's on fire or these guys are basically made of shadows and just like really mm. push the effects to the limit yeah absolutely um the nearest thing that 40k has to doing that is necromunda which has got a couple of new miniatures of its own uh a chem dealer sorry there's gorshiv hammer fist yes that's his name uh a ginormous stimmer uh, who carries around two whack-off hammers, uh, but not a fist hammer at any point, uh, with a bright green beard as well, because of course he does. And I reckon Ogre Kingdom's players are looking at this and salivating. Uh, on the other hand, you've got chem dealers and brute handlers. Uh, oh, right, sorry, yes, uh, I should have sent you a picture. Yes, my apologies. Sorry, I'm, I'm not being organized down my There you go. So that is Gorshiv Hammerfist. And there's two, I guess, hangers on, I suppose, a brute handler and a chem dealer coming along as well. Um, so the brute handler. I like, these. Mm. like the brute like the brute handler, the one with the um the whip for an arm. That can make a pretty good like servitor in, I reckon as well. Oh yeah, it's actually there in between games. If you hire a brute handler, you can make a willpower check and gain D3 experience uh, on them. 
as well as giving them some like extra checks on the board. Whereas chem dealers are more able to buy chems on the trading post in the black market, um, and they can also get. You make a really good, um, a good you know, engine zero tech priest kind of thing, like a Kai Rurge, and just give him like you know a servo harness mm. that could be really good, like you know, guard medic kind of thing. Yeah, or a plague doctor kind of thing as mm. well. Like, um, because if you if you put like a beak type thing on, it kind of looks like the mask of a plague doctor to me. I can definitely see that. And I do love the Necromunda models. The the Gorshiv Hammerfist, whatever his name is, he seems very busy mm, to me. I know what you mean. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a nice model, but I but sometimes you know less is more kind of thing. I think this one's a little too overly designed it's, a, it's not a bad model by any, by any measure or anything like that it's just a lot yeah I think painting the beard green was a deliberate move to draw the eye in that direction I mean it makes sense for Goliath considering like you know a lot of the old the old Goliath models especially had like bright green mohawks and stuff like that so I think it's like more of a reference to that more than anything else ah right yeah that makes sense mm-hmm. I do love that he's got the ta- instead of a tactical rock, he's got a tactical gear. Literally, he's got tactical gear. Hey! Oh, oh dear. Oh dear, oh dear. Uh, oh, come on, that was a good pun, you know it. Fine. <laughs> uh, in terms of models that are actually, you know, available, this week's uh, pre orders were the Slaves to Darkness, who have finally got their full release. And actually, they've been given way more than you might be expecting. Uh, they've not just been given their army box, which we'd seen before with the Demon Prince, the uh, Ogroid Myrmidons, no, Theridans, and the Chosen. They've also updated Chaos Warriors. They're updating Chaos Knights. Uh, they're nice. doing a bunch of stuff for Slaves to Darkness to really get that model range up to scratch and ready to go. Uh, they're not out just yet. I don't think they're in the Sunday orders this week, but they will be very soon. You had a lot of um, Ogor stuff this week mm. on pre-orders. Yeah, Ogor. I don't Mortrax. know if there's any big reason, but oh, it's a new um, battle term, is it? Yeah, new battle term. A new start collecting Vanguard box, which actually has no new models. It's uh, four lead belchers, two Morn Fangs, six bulls, the tyrant from the um, Flesh Eater Courts versus Ogre Kingdoms box. I've forgotten his name. A uh, Charnel Court, Carrion Court, something like that. Uh, as well as an Iron. At least you can get that one now. Yeah, you can. As well as an Iron Blaster or Scrap Launcher, they're also releasing the Blood Pelt Hunter, and they're um, releasing, you know, all the named Manita characters from back in the day, like Golgfag and uh, the uh, Butcher guy who has a massive hook. The old Scrag? Old Kingdom. Brag, that's it. Brag the Gutsman. That was his name. Well, they're all I, was, being... I, was, I was thinking Scrag the Slaughterer. Yeah, they're very similar names. There's Goldfag Maneater and Brag the Gutsman and one other who are all getting released as a new Maneater's kit so you can get those like classic models together. And you can even make them battle line. Yay. Shame we can't get a new Greaser's Gold Tooth. I know. Uh, it was just such yeah. a funny model, just this fat ogre being carried by like a carpet of nobblers. Yeah, ridiculous. The Assassins are also getting their releases. The Venom, the Venus, and the Adamus Assassins are also coming out on pre-order this week. And some tank crew for the Solar Auxilia and their Surgeon Primus. So uh, like a medic and uh, order these for the Solar Auxilia alongside rapier batteries as well. Plenty going on in the pre-orders. Also, I want to apologise if you can hear like weird noises in the background here. Some idiots setting off fireworks down my street. Well, because it is today, the 5th of November. It is indeed. And um, so expect a whole bunch of Viva Vendetta comments in the comments. To be fair, I As haven't heard any fact. of them yet, so... I haven't heard any either. Yet. My cat is probably hating them. Oh, bless him. Mm. Something's out. Remember, the, remember the 5th of November because I'm hungry or, and I need to go something. I don't know. I'm losing the plot. Gunpowder treason and losing the plot. <laughs> You got there eventually. You got there I got there eventually. Yeah. Stupid COVID. <laughs> the last model for the week was for the Horus Heresy, actually. The uh, Scorpius missile tank, uh, which I will just do that with. Oh, isn't that the, um, the discount whirlwind? Yes, I believe so. Uh, barrage weaponry um, 
indirect rhino fire chassis, yep. on a rhino, rending and pinning. Oh god. What's the name of that classical piece of music? You know, like This this is basically that's gonna be fun. Boom boom. I don't think it does. No, it's not Ed's Joy. No, Ed's Joy is like. Welcome to Classical Cars, where we talk about classical music. Where's my grandparents? They would know this. But no, I don't know. I know the piece, but I don't know its name. Speaking speaking of classical music, just very quickly, this is relevant to 40k. Right. Um. In Dark City, we find out that there's a Drukari homunculus who's a fan of Bach. Right. There you go. So there you go. It was tangentially related to 40k. We got back in the end. <laughs> we got there. <laughs> that was a nice little touch. It was, yeah. I can't remember who it is that Fabius listens to in one of Josh Reynolds' ones. He's a, a fan of like classical old terror music as well. Mm. Oh, it's going to bug me. There was also a piece of like... Um, the Emperor's favourite song was like a jaunty piece of piano music from Terra's Ancient Past, which I like to personally believe is the entertainer. <laughs> just mention the Emperor just sitting and just listen to it. And Malcolm goes, what are you listening to? It's like, it's called classical music. <laughs> Mind you, what we consider modern music will be classical music to them as well. I could, It could be all sorts of... There's a second time I've done that. Uh, there's all sorts of upbeat sort of piano-based music today as well, I'm sure, that could also be class. That I'm sure that someone's thinking of the Emperor walking in, uh, walk, being walked in on listening to Justin Bieber or something. There's like mental image like, I'm just listening to the classical music. I like big butts in a piano line. Well, thank <laughs> God's standing, <laughs> Plus, he would have lived through it as well, so he probably does have favourites from the early 2000s. Do you reckon he's a fan of Barbie Girl? Wouldn't put it past him. <laughs> when you said John T. Piano, I just thought it was like a thousand miles. Oh, it could be. It's yeah. the Emperor propelling a, a piano down a street, bopping away. <laughs> <laughs> That's the model they should do with the goth rock of the Emperor's children in a band, the Emperor on piano. <laughs> and the piano's on fire. <laughs> or just get an exorcist, you know, pipe organ. Always a good show. Right. In terms of news and stuff, I've roughly covered, well, we've roughly covered most of it. There's a lot of community-based stuff this week, a few battle reports, and Shooter's Blood and Teeth got a prequel comic as well uh, that was done over a few episodes uh, on here. Uh, Angels of Death got its feature-length final cut, so there's a super cut of the Angels of Death animation on Warhammer Plus if you really want to watch it and you already have Warhammer Plus. Um... Beyond that, there's not a lot for me to add on news. Fair enough. But you will be pleased to know that I did f- manage to finally finish Echoes of Eternity. Good. Because it's been about that. six six weeks since we started that. Yeah. Um, I would have mentioned it last week, but I was too busy dying. <laughs> um, Steve Carino hit me with a DDT, you see, so... Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll try and keep the wrestling based jokes to a minimum. Um, <laughs> but yes, um, how long has it been since that book came out? Because are we still going to need to be in the spoiler and brawl kind of thing? It says keep wrestling references to a minimum, immediately makes another one. In a bit, two months? A month two months? I mean, it's been two, three episodes, so um, I think we're probably fine. Okay, so um, if you want to. Avoid spoilers. Uh, tough as no spoiler room skip. Um, just skip forward by about 20 minutes or so. I don't know. <laughs> you, you're going to need 20 minutes for this? I don't know. <laughs> we'll see when we get there. We will. Um, so, last time during the Siege of Terror, um, everyone was hiding behind the walls and ready for the traitor inv- uh, assault to begin. Um, so we cut to the next day. 
And the Traitor Forces, you can see them all across horizon to horizon. You know, massive horde. Mm -hmm. And advancing towards the walls of the Eternity Gate is a single uh, Reaver Titan. Just a single, tra single Traitor Reaver Titan. And as he gets close to the walls, it stops. And through its speaker horn, well, it's, it's Foxcasters, it starts issuing Horus's demands. Basically saying, if you all turn around and run, if you lay down your weapons, you will be spared and granted amnesty. If you open the gate and let us in, you will be granted amnesty. If you do not open the gate and choose to fight against us, we will kill every single one of you. Yeah, that sounds about standard uh, uh, chaos-based understanding. Amnesty or death. And basically, like, Nessa Amos is just looking at Sanguis going, are we going to shoot this thing? <laughs> and, Sangu and Sanguis is like, no, because um, every second Horus wastes by just doing his little theatrics gives Gilliman more time to reach Terra, so let him waffle on. <laughs> good logic, good logic. The Titan then turns back and starts heading back towards own lines. And then Sanguinius basically takes to the air and starts giving a speech to all the defenders and basically says... Yeah, we're all going to die here. Um, so if you all want to run away and flee, I don't blame you. Um, no repercussions. You want to run, just run. I don't care. No one runs, of course. So if they do run, someone probably just shoots them in the back of the head for desertion. Sounds about right. Regardless. Um, he gives a rousing speech you know, to inspire the defenders to like stand against the tide. Blah, blah, blah. And then Sangoria basically flies towards that Reaver Titan and kills it. To which a huge horde of like demons like start chasing after Sanguinius in the air. The traitor horde starts advancing towards the walls, and we cut back and forth to like various individuals, like little t fight scenes. Like we got an emperor's children, uh, assault marine, like you know making his jumps with jump bag and then gets shot out of the air with a last cannon. He got some like traitor guard or traitor imperial army rather, you know, advancing in their transport only for the transport to get blown up. You know, space on the walls, etc. Blah blah blah. Carnage ensues everywhere. Yep. Inside the gate, uh, where all the civilians are cowering, there's a couple of custodians basically still on patrol who are held in reserve kind of thing. And one of them is approached by a little girl who basically says, I have something I need you to see. Oh God. So the custodian follows her, and they open up this door, and it's filled to the brim with flies and corpses. This is the massacre of the administratum, I assume. No. Oh. Um, but the custodian, he sees this, and he has only has time to report two words to every single custodian and Malkador present. They're in. As in, demons are now breaching the gate. They're breaching the defences. Yeah. And we'll explain why in a bit. <laughs> I'm assuming he died, um, but... Uh, no, the Emperor's not dead, no. No, I meant the custodian who only got two words out because he died. We'll find out later. Fine. <laughs> um, come back to the, the walls. You know, everyone's like fighting for their lives because it's absolutely you know carnage. Space Marines fighting Space Marines, basically stepping over the regular humans, just like crushing them under foot. The dead bodies are piling up so thick that it's literally just a pile of sludge, basically from all the boys that have been trampled by Space Marines. God. Li literally just a pile of pink bloody sludge beneath everyone's feet so basically everyone's like everyone's like fighting in mud but the mud is corpses lay it on thick authors <laughs> um Nasir Ahmed ends up fighting against Cargos Bloodspitter because they end up fight meeting together okay. and Cargos is like fight hacking away and was like I'm a cure I'm a cure but Nasir Ahmed is just blocking block block turn on side blow block parry defend <laughs> And then he gets his weapon knocked out of his hand. That's how he basically hooks Cargus' arms with his chain. Basically hooks the chains around him. The chains around Cargus' arm. And then, in the most typically Nasir Amit fashion imaginable, he starts eating Cargus' face. Nice. Not, just, not biting, eating, as in like tearing chunks away and swallowing. For God's sake, I was having Scorpion from Mortal Kombat vibes by grab the chain and yank, and then I got Reptile vibes by literally eating your face. For goodness. And Cargos is like, God, he can he can feel like, you know, 
you know, his bones exposed because you can feel the cold air against his bones, whatever. Oh, God. And Amit basically, like, ends up getting a chain around him and like, twist, twist, pull, pull, pull. And it doesn't pull the head off, but he ends up, like... He end, well, he does end up killing Cargos in the end because there was only one way the fight could end, let's be honest. Yeah, Amit had to win because he goes on to found the Flesh Terrace. <laughs> exactly. And... As the fight's continuing, you know, dead space beings piling up everywhere. Um, there's piles of dead blood angels, and from the piles of dead blood angels, a demon known as the Bane of the Ninth Bloodline emerges. It should be Kabanda. It is Kabanda. So. Yeah. It's revealed basically after he calls himself the Bane of the Ninth Bloodline, but I do like that name, Bane of the Ninth Bloodline. I'd heard... That's it, a good name. Was he called, like, the Angel's Bane for a bit? I think so. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, um, Kabanda is basically, you know, tearing through the blame shows because we found out what happened to him after Cygnus Prime. Oh, um, this should be interesting. Yeah, Korn was not happy. No he shit. He was incredibly pissed off. No shit. Um, so basically he banished, uh, Kabanda from his realm. So basically Kabanda was basically stalking, you know, warp space between realms, essentially. He got star and he was basically branded. essentially, and he was being hunted by other demons because they think, like, oh, he's lost master's favor. If we kill him, we'll go up in the ranks, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So this forced uh, Kabanda to learn how to be cunning as opposed to just a mindless killing brute. Yep, checks out. And after he regained a portion of his strength, he went back to Corn's realm and says, I mean, he basically demanded. Redemption is like, I demand another chance. And Corn basically says to him, All right, you have to kill 500 blood angels. Oh, that's easy enough. And you have to kill them in Sanguinius's presence. Oh. So Cabanda's now just going around ki- killing blood angels left and right, targeting them. He's basically trying to get Sanguinius's attention. No, it's me. Basically, just killing everyone. Pansui? I said, no, it's me, Senpai. <laughs> <laughs> also, I find it odd that Corn is not using any multiple of eight. Yeah, that was a bit weird, but... I might be just remembering the exact number. It has been a while since I've read the book, so... Uh, feel free to correct me in the comments. Um, but anyway... Um, traitor's numbers start overwhelming you know, the defenders, and Sanguine starts ordering everyone to start pulling back towards the gate. Get inside, we'll lock the doors. Anyone stuck outside, sorry, you're fucked. Bye bye. Yep. <laughs> but Sanguine is very sanguine. He's basically trying to delay it as long as possible, just to the very last moment, just to get as much people back in. Yep. And as they're doing so, uh, Kabanda and Sanguine end up having another fight. Sanguine is basically just curb stomps him. Because, let's be honest, you know, that's the only way it could go at this point. I'm surprised. Uh, I I know Sanguinius wins, breaks Commander's back. I know that's the whole mythos of the ending of that fight. I'm surprised it was so one-sided. It's because Commander's still rebuilding his strength. But Sanguinius has been under siege for weeks, months at this point. Yes. But, you know, it's got to lead up to what happens next. Angra. So, basically... Let me finish. Sorry. <laughs> um... So, Sanguinius dispatches Commander after a short but very brutal fight and starts saying, right, close the gate, close the gate. As the gates start closing, bang, 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 three Ursus claws hit the gate. Oh, no. And start wrenching back. The gates start slowing down. It's slowing, it's slowing, it stopped. The gates no longer closing because the Ursus claws are holding it in place, holding it taut. Mm-hmm. And Sanguinius is like, right, I'll go and cut these chains. There's only three of them. I can get it done quickly. Then here's someone shouting his name. He looks up. Angron's plummeting down top speed towards him. Uh-oh. Yeah. They has fight. Obviously. <laughs> uh, obviously. Um, it's a very, very brutal, very bloody fight. But Sanguinius, in possibly one of the most holy shit badass moments he ends up 
ripping the butcher's nails out of Angron's skull and causing his skull to explode. What the actual hell? <laughs> because remember, the butcher's nails replaced half of Angron's brain and spinal column. That's essentially so a decapitation, then. Yeah. And he casts Angron's body down, it tumbles down, blum, blum, blum. The defenders start cheering, the traitors are like, what the fuck? Yep. And this basically prompts the World Eaters to start turning on everyone. Because they basically are like, oh shit, I just kill everyone, fuck it. Yeah, <laughs> they've, it they've lost control. Yeah, that makes total sense, to be honest. Like, we remember what happened to the Blood Angels when Sanguinius was cast down, then add in a million more layers of psychopathy, and uh, yeah. Hmm. Um, the chains I get broken, the gate is shut, and Sanguinius is inside, he just about gets inside, he's still holding the butcher's nails, drops on the floor, and they're just twitching, like a, like, like a squid on the floor. It's interesting, though, because Demon Angron, we've seen his model, Demon Angron has the nails back, implying that when Angron reforms... They're, they're and part the, of him. Yeah, I know that, yeah. but I always... The way I understood the nails was the nails were the nails, and Angron's body changed into a demonic form so why would he when he was banished regrow new nails i found that other it's just i did i would have never thought of that at all i suppose it's not really up to him true because obviously like when you ascend you sort of become a bit of your god so like corn probably just enjoys messing with them it's like no you're never gonna get away from them yeah. The pain makes you angry. Angry is good. We like angry because we're, you know, psychopathic killing machines. You're right. Essentially. Um, meanwhile, in orbit, the Tara Saren on the Conqueror is basically getting a report. It's like, um, what the hell's actually going on down there? What do you mean Angron's dead? Um, she asks for a report. The guy on the comms looks past her towards her throne. She she doesn't he doesn't look at her. He looks at her throne. And she's like, excuse me, I'm over here. And a voice from behind her says, no, you're not. She turns around, and on her throne is basically a demonic version of Latara Saren. You know, big black eyes, huge teeth, dagger claws for hands, you know. And it turns out the version of Latara Saren we've been following throughout the story isn't actually Latara Saren. It's an echo of her. Oh. Um. The real Latara Saren has basically ascended essentially become part of the Conqueror as part of a, a demonic core to the Conqueror. I mean, yeah, she would. That That's the logical fate for Latara Saren, to be completely honest. I just want to point out, called it! <laughs> <laughs> called it about two, three years ago. Called it. I'm proud of that. <laughs> well done. Well yeah. done. It's not often I get, it's not often I'm proven right, but I'll take this. <laughs> take the wins where I can get them. I'll take the wins. Now, you may be wondering how are demons able to breach through um, the Emperor's Barrier? This is where we cut to Vulcan's story. Because Vulcan has basically gone on a little soiree into the webway. Because, of course. Because, because Malgador has informed that something in the webway is disrupting the field. Right. And as he makes his way through the webway, he meets Magnus. Now, this is a callback, obviously, to the Fury of Magnus novella, we assume. Yep. Because remind us what happened at the end of that book. At the end of Fury of Magnus, basically, um, Magnus... Uh, well, Magnus got beaten up so hard by Vulcan, he ended up becoming a demon prince. <laughs> yeah. And somehow he's in the webway now. Yeah, because he was he was banished from the palace. So I assume since he was banished, you know, banished back to the warp briefly, then from the warp he basically just went through into into the webway through one of the breaches, possibly for the breach he himself created, or possibly because there was no way because of the emperor's field being up and all of that, Magnus's demonic just presence. Into the webway. There was no connection to the warp. There, I mean, maybe. No, but. Magnus and Vulcan have this big philosophical debate which basically says that the events of Fury of Magnus never actually fucking happened. Oh, for God's sake. He was like, I was, like, I was there when Father promised me a new legion and stuff like that. And Vulcan's like, that never happened. It was like, 
well, thanks for wasting my time with Fury of Magnus, guys. <laughs> Well, it's, um, is it observer bias? Has Vulcan been told to lie because it would have proved that Magnus was redeemable? Well, he, I don't know. It, he, Vulcan basically says to Magnus, like, you always think that you've done nothing wrong. Yeah, I'm also making fun of the whole, you know, Magnus did nothing wrong meme. Yeah. But, you know, Magnus basically like, you know, I, I was justified, I had to do this, blah, blah, blah. And Magnus has basically been working behind the scenes using his powers to basically chip away at the Emperor's field to allow Horus's minions in. The two end up having a fight, because of course they have to. They have to. Yep. Um, Magnus kills Vulcan again and again and again. Now, some may say, ah, this proves that Vulcan's still a perpetual. It does not, because I have an exact quote from this novel in which Magnus says to Vulcan after he keeps being resurrected, I see him behind you. I see him composing the concerto of your resurrective immortality. Him being the Emperor. Yeah. So basically, the Emperor is the one responsible for resurrecting Vulcan in this time. Why am I getting Doctor Strange vibes? <laughs> um... So Magnus basically said, well, if I can't kill you, I'm literally going to unmake you from existence. And basically starts destroying him at a atomic level. Basically, so like Vulcan's body starts dissolving, you know, huge plumes of light start flashing through, you know, like in a very typical, you know, sci-fi type of way. God. But as he's doing this, Ma uh, Vulcan, with his hammer, you know, as hard as he can, basically just smashes Magnus in the face, banishing him. Basically, it's a kill blow. They're both effectively dead. Vulcan's now just a charred skeleton. He'll be back. Um, because it's Vulcan, the skeleton, the skeleton gets up and tracks his hammer and walks away. For fuck's sake. Uh, remember what I said earlier that 40k is inherently silly? <laughs> this. <laughs> Now, uh, that's the basic end of it, but before the story actually ends completely, back from the Latara scene briefly, um, the traitor fleet starts being bombarded from the surface. Basically, a whole bunch of anti-orbital you know, anti -orbital batteries sort of thing starts unloading on the traitor fleet, and the traitor fleet's like, whoa, what the fuck did that come from? The Tara ship, the Conqueror, gets a transmission from the White Scars. Hi, Shaban Khan here. Guess what? We've retaken the Lionsport, uh, Lionsgate spaceport and we've reactivated all the weapons. Have fun. Ta-ta. <laughs> God's sake. Oh, yeah. And at this point, the traitors basically realize, hang on, why aren't the shields up on the Vengeful Spirit? Why are the shields down? Because no Horan one knows. is an idiot. No one knows. And the story basically ends like, right, um, we're going to have to take the fight to Horus. But before we do, we cut to a... It, the story literally ends on a communication from Gilliman. We will be in the system in a couple of days. Just hang on a little longer. That's why Horus dropped the shields. The Ultramarines will be in the system within two to three days. So basically, yeah, Horus has made a tactical call. He's probably heard that communique. Yep, because um, the Conqueror intercepted it. Does it make it to Terra, or does the Conqueror actually full-on stop it reaching Terra? It stops it full-on. Right. So the Conqueror gets it, tells Horus, right, Gilliman's two days away. We can't win... Well, Horus then has this... Well, well no, they don't They don't. They get it. It's like, oh, how cute. Um, why is Horus's shields down? Well, because the Vengeful Spirit's picked it up too, and Horus has gone, shit. Yeah. <laughs> Because we're at the point now, even though the traitors are basically winning at this point, they won't be able to withstand, you know, a full Ultramarines Legion. Bear in mind, they are the largest Legion. And Gilmanos said, oh, by the way, um, I've got Russ, I've got Lion, I've got Korax, they're all with me. Yeah, it's not one Legion, it's effectively about two and a half. Yeah. Uh, depending two, on how Two and a half you... Legions and four Primarchs. Yeah, um, ain't nobody withstanding that. And again, considering that Gilliman's Legion, quarter of a million strong, and the next largest Legion's about 100,000. 
And I think that next largest legion, after possibly the word bearers, is the Dark Angels. So actually, it was the Iron Warriors, but they fucked off. Yeah, they fu- yeah, <laughs> exactly. So problems. So I can understand once Helros hears that message. Ah, right, we're done then. Uh, all or nothing. Yes. To be I, continued. I do like that they've kept that because obviously, like the early thing. People were like, oh, little Horus is having doubts. He'll be the one to drop the shields, or oh, Loken will do it. And it's good to see that obviously a few candidates are dead if you're out of the game, but it's like, it's just Horus like playing the final gambit. That's what I like. Mm-hmm. Some things Agreed. don't need to be subverted. Yeah, I, I'm curious as to which version of events they're actually going to go for. If they're going to go for the version where Horus is basically lowering a shield to tempt the Emperor into boarding him. Or if it's just the version where Horus was so arrogant, he lowered the shield so he can get a better look at at the Emperor dying. With the context that we've just been given, I think... It seems like the former. It's the former, but also he's not doing it because he's baiting the Emperor. He's doing it because he is the one who is desperate. Mm. Uh, And it's like, Mm. I can't win any other way. I need to take Emps out now. Yes, it should be interesting because we've got two more books to go. Yeah, I'm not it, calling it one because it's a two. It's a part one and a part two. It's it's two books, not one. Let's yeah, be honest. The end and the dead. <laughs> the end of the death, isn't it? Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> but yeah, um, all in all, good novel. Good. I admit, it's always it was always going to be difficult with that book because there were some facts kind of enshrined in terms of like and some conflicting like who's first through the gate um sanguinius versus commander then they threw angron into the mix um and they're really doing a good job of crossing a few things off now as well as setting us up and not closing every loop i'm not sure that every decision they've made in this series will go down well in history but it does seem like they're doing a good job of tying up loose ends Mm. I am curious as to who will actually be the person to take that proverbial bullet for the Emperor on the Vengeful Spirit. Because we have a few candidates. You know, is it going to be generic custodian? Is it going to be generic Terminator? Is it going to be Alanius Pius? Or is it going to be Garvey or Loken? It's... I, pers- I know I say it all the time, but I want it to be Loken just so we can come full circle with the story. You know, I was there when Horus slew the Emperor kind of thing, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And it, I, and it would be a good end to his arc. Agreed. I think the other question that we'll need answering is the death of Horus itself, because you could either see it, there's two ways of seeing it, because the way it's often portrayed is the Emperor sees mysterious person cast down by Horus and realizes he's too far gone and murders him. But then there's a secondary addition to that of the Emperor almost murders him and Horus snaps back to reality and goes, please, Dad, kill me. Yeah, that was the version in Visions of Heresy, yeah. Mm. So it'll be interesting to see if they do redeem Horus in death, or try, or not. I reckon they will go the Visions of Heresy route just because that is itself part of the Horus Heresy series, you know, even if it's just basically a glorified picture book. Mm. Um, That's true. But since Mm. it has the branding, I reckon that will be the outline they will take. There's there's a line that sort of obviously people go back and forth on you know does he love them are they tools there's a line in I'm sure it's in Valdor towards the very end where Malkador's first like oh you know the the sons might still be alive he's calling them his sons you know and Valdor's kind of like oh so is humanity's ebbing again and it's just this idea of like that the emperor's kind of so you know powerful and so sort of post human that it's like sort of his very humanity kind of like comes and goes. Like as if he has like <laughs> whims. Just, I'm gonna love yeah. them today. <laughs> I mean, there's also the, um, the fact you got to take into account is the fact that out of all of them, you know, ignoring the stuff in the Alfaris novel, but out of all of them, Horus is the one that's been around with the Emperor the most. He was the favourite, and even if you have a favourite tool, like if you got like you know a favourite hammer or a favourite book, you know, you're still gonna be bummed out or upset if it gets lost or damaged, aren't you? You know. <laughs> Because yeah. the fact is, you know, your favourite, it's the one that's been around the longest, you get used to that, so I can see, like, why he has this, like, this is my favourite, I don't want to break my toy. <laughs> yeah, 
Or maybe they're going with it because obviously there's the idea of shards of the emperor in the, the splintered psyche and all of that. Maybe the other way that his humanity ebbing and flowing isn't that the emperor changes on a whim, which is a, certainly a very valid way of looking at it. But it could be that we're looking at maybe not multiple personality disorder type thing, but maybe there are so many aspects to the emperor that what how he is changes from time to time, place to place, day to day, person to person. Mm-hmm. Maybe. Maybe. So basically, he's Ermac. Well, okay, yeah, and the Mortal Kombat comes back again. I mean, how, let's be honest, how often can you make a bloody Ermac reference? But hey. <laughs> yeah, that's very true, actually, to be fair. Mm. But yeah, all in all, Echoes of Eternity, I highly recommend it. I also managed to um, read through uh, Dark City, complete it. I'm not going to do a full beat by beat thing on the plot. But I am going to touch upon something that happens towards the end. Oh, God. Because, just because I need to talk about it because it's so absolutely insane. I need to talk about this. So insane it's... good or insane bad? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Right, context. Right. Go on. Right, so for context, um, three of the High Lords of Terror are involved in a conspiracy to use the Drukari to repair the Golden Throne because it's failing. Fine, we, we're aware of this that, idea. That's the context. Now, the context, um, the main inquisitors of the story, along with the inquisitorial um, antagonist, um, they basically joined forces and have been joined by a group of custodians and some Tempest of Silence. They've gone to the webway and they found this staging area where the fabricator general of the, of the Mechanicus, who's one of the high lords involved in this conspiracy, is basically preparing to exchange um, some, well, do a trade with with Drukari, because Drukari said, we will give you these parts, you give us these old damaged parts. You know? Mm -hmm. And these old damaged parts, you know, they've been on parts of the Golden Throne, have been, you know, close to the Emperor, like, you know, um, respiratory tubes, you know, blood, you know, that kind of thing. Um, Now, Inquisitor Crowl, the main Inquisitor of the story, even though he's not actually a main character in this book, he's more of a main supporting character because most of the book focuses on um, his interrogator. Right. But Crowl basically is like, yeah, I, this is dodgy as fuck. I'm going to try and find some more information about it. As you should. And basically through complex shenanigans involving essentially magic mirrors, don't ask. Won't. Um, I'm skipping over a lot of details, so if you want a more comprehensive version of events, read the book. Trust me, you won't regret it. Um, but basically, he ends up seeing Kimura. He's he basically his disembodied spirit is flying around Kimura. Right. And this is during the time of the disjunction, basically when the Gate of Cain has broken, demons now invading Kimura. This is when Ibrahim comes along, isn't it? She's not involved in the story, no. But she's in her... But, but... But it's in, in law, this is basically where her story begins, essentially. Right, yes, yes, yes. I knew everyone was tied to that disjunction, but I couldn't remember how. Now, earlier, um, Crawl had... T- Crawl had basically speaking to a homunculus, and it was actually the one that he had killed in the first book. And basically, like, how the hell are you even alive? Ah, you see, the homunculi, we can bring anyone back to life. All we need is just a single drop of blood. That's all we need. We can bring anyone back to life. Oh no, they're going to resurrect the Emperor, aren't they? That was partially their plan. They wanted to make their own Emperor, because as Crow Spirits fire on Kimura, he sees the Drukari building their own version of the Golden Throne. Because they realise the Emperor's power is basically what's stopping demons invading Terra from the Webway Gate. So basically they think, ah, have our own. They can push the demons out back through the Gate of Cain. And because these are old parts from the Golden Throne, like respiratory tubes and that, dried blood, skin cells. Yeah, right. And Kraus like, like soylent green as people, in you know, moments kind of thing. Um, and to which the Castarians immediately start, you know, butchering things left, right, and center, destroying the parts. Huge fight breaks out. Um, the Imperial forces are vastly outnumbered by the Drukari. Uh, so, Crowl and the other, his interrogator and the other inquisitor basically try to flee. 
Weber Gate 500 has been collapsed by rubble. They're trying to flee, get out. Um, one by one, they're dying. They're being picked off. And they all die. The end. <laughs> So what we have learned here today, boys and girls, is that the Drakari are building their own version of the Emperor to fix Komara, which is the stupidest well, idea ever they, because he's a psyker. Yeah, and they were going to use his psychic powers to keep the demons out because that's basically what he's doing on Terra. But the whole Harshly. point is no psychers in Komara because it attracts demons. Like, that's just... But it's not more a case of no Eldari psychers in Komara because it attracts Slanesh. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, that makes more sense. And remember, the Emperor is anathema. Also that. But yeah, and the Custodians made sure um, that wouldn't happen because they destroyed all the equipment that had potential skin cells and all that. Like they atomized it down, I assume. Basically blew it, blew it to fuck up. <laughs> Good. But yeah, um, end, of the Vault of Terror, end of Vault of Terror ends with everyone dying and then we cut to a random feral world somewhere dinosaurs walk in the background and there's a webway gate and out from the webway gate pops a servo skull which is amazing oh, yeah. which is a servo skull that's been from um a supporting character in the book and it basically just asking where is everyone the end <laughs> <laughs> if one but in, in, a, in a much the sadder point. tone it's a much sadder tone sad beeping essentially sad beeping so yeah, yeah. dark city everyone dies <laughs> the end. I mean, that's not the insane part. That's just every maybe tenth forty k no, no, novel. But no, the insane part was like, hey, um, the Drukari want to basically have their own emperor on a golden throne. What? <laughs> yeah. What? Mind you, we'll make an interesting video one day. I reckon. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's just free fodder for the theory machine. So, oh, absolutely. But um, but I, I, I will say this in regards to the Vaults of Terror trilogy, Dark City is the weakest book. It's not a bad book, mm. but it's definitely the weak, the weakest one in the three. Yeah, I've had a, a similar experience this week actually because I finished Aramand Eternal, oh. and I started it like several episodes ago, and I finally got round to finishing it. I binged it while I was on a train somewhere, and it didn't really. <laughs> end on a positive note or set up or pay off anything. It did something quite interesting with the rubric plot line, but it didn't really feel like it ended at a logical place to end, if you know what I mean. Because right. I think when we saw the book, everyone was confused. And this is not a, a dig at John French, by the way. John French is an exceptional author and the book is good. I just... I get the feeling he wrote it or was briefed to write it in a way that Ivrain did not come up. Because this is a pre Ivrain story. The Harlequins are involved in the background, but it's all pre Ivrain. And Ivrain never comes up. The Gathering Storm never comes up. Even in the epilogue with the Harlequins, Ivrain or Coelia or nothing comes up. And. Mm. You're left wondering, okay, so Armin went after the Necrons because they have chronometry. Okay, cool. And they do some cool things with those Necrons. But the way the book ends is essentially how to put this in a way that makes sense. So, the final boss for Armin is the Phaeron of the tomb world that they have been taken to by a Cryptek. The Cryptek is actually the Phaeron in disguise. Um, and this dynasty mm. has been punished for messing around with time by the Triarch that they were sealed in a sub-dimension that was, like, not like the warp or the webway, but like uh, an out-of-time dimension, like a place outside of time a because of dimension. all their... Yeah, kind of, but in the same... They were still in the same place, but outside of time for all their time fuckery. Um, right, so effectively, um, out of chrono sync. Kind of, yeah. Um, Armin wins that fight through luck, to be completely honest, and skill, because he realises that time is being rewound on him every time he fights the Phaeron and uh, wins, um, or 
almost wins. And so he ends up, instead of taking the hit, he finally realizes what's going on, dodges it and kills the Phaeron outright, using a ritual of his sorcerers to stand in the out-of-time dimension, um, essentially. But the interesting plot is with Helio Isidorus. Now, that name, for those of you who haven't read the series, is... The That's Ru- the one who was killed, wasn't it? Yes. Um, he's the rubrique who came back after the second rubric. Now, throughout the book, the Thousand Sons are on the run from that second rubric, the Pyrodomon, they call it. Um, and towards the end, the Harlequins attack their fleet, and one of the sorcerers, ah, his name's escaped me at the moment, uh, Catasias, I think, gets trapped inside Helio Isidorus's head. Oh. Um, and he's trying to help Helio piece together what is going on in his head because Helio remembers fragments. He remembers terror a little bit. He remembers a bit about Tizka. He remembers the burning of Prospero a little bit. He remembers fragments, but can't put it together. And he intends to keep Catasias locked in his head until he can put it together. It turns out that what the Pyrodomon, the rubric Helio is, is the same thing. It's the end of the Thousand Suns, their doom that they've been running from and trying to change their fate time and time and time again. The flesh change in Magnus, the rubric, the second rubric, all of it has been a way of trying to stave off fate. And Helio, if he can put it together in his head, will claim the Thousand Suns. The the Pyrodomon will claim them all. And they end up accidentally, where Helio touches the brain, the body of the sort of, uh, the sorcerer who controls the automata. Uh, His name's got out my head as well. Um, And because he touches him in the Tizka vision, he suffers the Pyrodomon and is wiped and turned into a rubric. So there's a connection there of how the power of Helio's brain is affecting the Thousand Suns today because he is the rubric incarnate, if you will. Right. Um, and so Catasias essentially has to fight his way out and kill Helio to stop him putting it together in such a way as he can escape. At the cost of his own soul and being rubriced himself, he is able to stop Helio from putting it together. Helio lives, but seems to be reset a bit in that when he talks to Aram and he seems to be back to his version of normal, where he doesn't remember anything. He he hears Aram's name, they speak, and then the next time it's like talking to him again, it's kind of like he's got exceptionally advanced dementia, if you will. Mm. And that's where the book kind of ends. Of like, There's no... They sneak off following the Necron fleet as the dynasty reawakens uh, with the Thousand Sons in their tail, just sneaking away. The Harlequins say, yep, we've done what we need to do. Fate continues. We need to assume new roles. Someone becomes a solitaire. And the book just ends. And So is it like a case of like, this is a book that was there just as sequel bait, essentially? Or... It's an interesting plot, but it feels like the most interesting plot was the B-plot, with Helio Isidorus, and Araman was nowhere near resolving it because he was stuck inside a chrono sync pocket dimension at the time. Right. Araman mm. was not involved. I'm not saying Araman needed to solve everything, but he doesn't know about it because he's in a pocket dimension. It all happens in Helio's head with Catasias. Araman doesn't know because Catasias gets rubriced and Helio gets wiped. No one knows what happened. And so I don't feel like. Armin just like went and explored a lead, it failed, and he's none the wiser. Or if he is wiser, he's certainly not letting on to the audience or to anybody. He's just even more suspicious of everyone around him because they all are. And that's where the book kind of ends. Like, if the epilogue had been, we go to Coelia or we go for Comara, there is something there we must set into motion with the Harlequins, that would have been enough to say, okay, that was a way of moving Armin from the second rubric to the Gathering Storm. But there's no indication that that was the case. 
at all. It just felt like Armin on a little jolly that went very, very badly wrong, whilst the actual interesting plot about the rubric happened off screen. Well, on screen for us, but away from Armin's attention. Okay, yeah. Hmm. So essentially like, it's, it's a good Ar- book, and it. Oh, so essentially, it's Armin's grand day out. Yeah, it's a good book. It reads well, but the first three books, particularly Armin Exile and Armin Unchanged, were. Re- those are books that stick with me even though I haven't read them for 10 years those books have stuck with me Eternal I feel like I'm probably going to forget and then when the next one comes out I'll be like oh I want to read this now but I'll have completely forgotten the Eternal plot fair enough yeah I'd say this is not a dig at John French I'm, I don't know if you've spoken with John before Mark he, he's an exceptional author and I look forward oh, to hopefully fantastic. speaking with him someday but I just felt compared to the exceptional high standard of everything John French has done, this wasn't quite as high. It could have been a novella, and I would have been happy with it. Mm-hmm. And there is a danger with that sometimes, like especially if you've got such a well constructed. Just me, but uh, that like, was my experience with uh, with it. I was just saying, when sometimes when you have such like a well constructed trilogy where like all the working parts, like when John French writes things, I find it's like a sort of intricate like Swiss watch. Mm. Especially when it comes to like continuity, he just knows his stuff so well, and everything's like so well put together. And especially the Araman books with all the jumping around they had to do. But like yeah. sometimes when you have to then revisit it, it's like, what what can I do now? It's, and, it's like I mean, Indiana sometimes... Jones. It's like the, yeah. the trilogy is great, and the fourth one's was just a miss because the first three were so good mm-hmm. but then it's also like sometimes you do need that book that is like pure setup you do but and that's normally what book two's job is for and if it's not if it's the sequel to a trilogy you kind of need to start strong or end yeah, strong um but no uh he is an exceptional author and i always i i don't ever think about it in the context of, but when we talk about all these books in the podcast we do it so often you almost worry that like, the author's going to hear this and sort of get annoyed that we're critiquing and uh, and unpicking their books. I always worry that if we're doing that, we're almost annoying some of you and never and losing our potential guest bookings because we've annoyed you with our nitpicking. I'm sure it wouldn't come to that. No, I hope not. But yeah, I mean, Random I think authors generally, it's like if, as long as it's constructive criticism, I feel you'll probably not lose a guest. Yeah, that's fair. But I would like to speak to John someday because he does seem like a really great person to work with and talk to. Oh, definitely is. Oh, um, actually, I do have one question for you, Mark. Actually, if you don't mind asking, because um, I've, no, I've just I've just started Void King. I'm not going to go into any spoilers for the viewers. Don't worry, not yet. Um, I just want to ask a, a couple of quick questions. If that's all right. Um, because I don't I don't know if that's actually explaining the book. If it is explaining the book, then just you know tell me to shut up or whatever. <laughs> but, um, regarding the um. The Hellvinter dynasty. Mm-hmm. Um, judging from the language used, I'm assuming they're from Fenris. Mm-hmm. How curious, how did a, a Fenrisian gain a um, warrant of trade? So what I wanted to approach in the novel is like there's sort of, especially when you have sort of like the, the introduction of the dynasties at the beginning, um, there's sort of different... Um, approaches I'm, I'm a big fan of like the rogue trader uh tabletop rpg mm. and obviously in that there's a lot of different ways for you to become a rogue trader so i wanted to sort of like draw the line between like some of them are properly hereditary right. like um the lamartines and the redrexis and some of them are very much inherited kind of in recent memory like the um the Narastia. But the Hellvinters, I always envisage as kind of being somewhere in the middle. Like, they have a pedigree and the family's been there for a long time, but it's more that sort of one of her ancestors would have inherited it, essentially, right. from the rogue trader that potentially they were taking up from the ice to serve. Right, okay. So it's that kind of, at some point in the past, they became, they moved from being, like, the inheritors to the sort of the familial dynasty. Right, gotcha. Um, so I only ask because um, when you think of Ferris, you, you literally think of a very feral world that's basically stuck in the Bronze Age, particularly. So I was just curious, like, mm-hmm. how the hell did they beca- become world traders, <laughs> kind of thing. Um, so I was just curious about that. So f- thank you for answering that question. Much appreciated. No problem. 
Yeah, Fenrisians also have a bad habit of pissing everybody off because they're just so brash. <laughs> yeah, she definitely has a bit of that to her, does Catla. Mm. But no, I'm about six chapters in so far and I'm enjoying it so far, so I look forward to finishing it off. Oh, good. I'm glad you're enjoying it. Yes, I'm, I'm sure that uh, even if we don't get a full episode dissection like Echoes of Eternity gets, uh, I'm sure we'll do a review at some point. Um, Absolutely. Maybe, but yes. Um, my brain was going to say something and it's completely forgotten. Was it cream cakes, cream cakes, cream cakes? No. <laughs> Not helping, Ram. Um, <laughs> do, 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 I never do, help. Do. I just, I'm just here to, to basically shitpost and cause confusion and make the occasional wrestling reference. One Mortal Kombat. <laughs> and that too. <laughs> <laughs> and telling you to go play System Shot 2 and watch Akira. Yes. You you can keep trying it. Uh, it it's not going to happen for. Do it do it, at the, do it at the same time like Dark Side of the Moon and the Wizard of Oz. Oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> God. Dear, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. If you would like to buy Tactical Imperial as a copy of System Shock Two, please leave a comment down below. <laughs> I don't have a Steam wish list. Don't even try. <laughs> People just start saying keys. Well, here's the thing, Tag. They can just give you a Steam code. They can buy it as a gift and give you the code. There you go. Yeah, I know. A friend of mine did that with, uh, I think it was Fallout New Vegas. They did that for me. Um, Speaking of Steam, this is relevant. Um, currently, oh, Vermintide 2 is free on Steam. Nice. Nice. And it will be on fr- free on Steam, I think it's to like the 11th, I think it said. Hmm. So yeah, if you ain't got it, you can get it for free. No excuse. Unless your computer can't run it like mine. <laughs> I mean, you've only just graduated from dining room tray to desk, so we can not blame you for your computer being a bit behind the ages as well. Yeah. I'm getting there slowly but surely. Absolutely. Who knows, this time next year, I might have a boom arm for my mic. <laughs> I mean, I don't. I've just got a freestanding mic, to be fair. Yeah. I, want to, I mean, I, I can actually host a boom mic now because I've actually got, like, this desk is actually a proper wood. It's not like a cheap MDF piece of crap. It's actually a proper... Yeah, huge piece of wood. Excellent. Like seriously, it's about like two inch. It's like about two inches thick. But anyway, I do believe it might be time for some questions. Yes, uh, we didn't really get time for any last episode either, so uh, we'll flick through a few things. Um, okay, so since we talked about the emperor and things shenanigans involving getting a new emperor in different places here's a question could the emperor be transferred into a modified dreadnought and attached to the throne perhaps using that dreadnought to bypass some of the failing bits on the golden throne i doubt it personally um it depends on which version of the emperor's lifespan you go for if you go by the logic he's still a perpetual if he lost his perpetual during his fight with Horus and the golden throne is literally his life support system because if you disconnect the emperor from the life support system <laughs> you know because let's be yeah, honest you've got, you got to disconnect him from the, from the chair to put him into a dreadnought how long does does he last before you know kicking the bucket how long does the astronomican last as well that's what the choir is mm. for and then is he still holding back the tide and is the failsafe bomb thing still on? The Terminus Decree. I'm thinking more about the Talisman of Hammers. Yeah. Oh yeah, that. Sorry. Because at first it was like, oh, we can't take him out because demons will flood in. But then it was like, we can't take him out because demons will flood in and then terror will explode. So it's now sort of a, a layered, like a tiered cake of bad ideas. So at the end of the day, it's all Magnus's fault. <laughs> of course. That was actually something um, when you were talking about, like, you know, oh, that never happened. There's a bit when Vulcan first meets Magnus in Echoes where um, he says something along the lines of, you know, he goes to Vulcan, oh, you are you were going to say this. You know, you were going to come here and say, how did it come to this? Is there any way mm-hmm. back from it? All that sort of thing. And then Vulcan kind of, like, swallows back those words and then Magnus is like, aha, but... Now you're thinking, I didn't see them, so I, you know, I've subverted you, but it's like, no, that's what prophecy is all about. So it's like, maybe it didn't happen, but like, 
maybe Magnus just saw what all the options were and sort of lived them subjectively. It's like I'm four parallel universes ahead of you, kind of thing. Yeah, basically, he's playing three <laughs> dimen- like three dimensional chess with himself. I mean, it, yeah, when you're playing with Zinch, then yeah, you are basically playing seven D chess with yourself, and you always lose. So, Perfect. oh my goodness. Um, speaking of Astartes and Primarchs, is it stated anywhere aside from the Sons of Horus? That as an Astartes ages, their facial features more and more closely resemble their Primarch. Yes. Um, for yeah, enough, it was like, it, yeah, Echoes of Eternity. It mentioned about how um, a lot of the Blood Angels basically started looking more like Sanguinius. Oh, very well then. Yeah, it's like that they're almost exact copies. Like it's not homage, it's simulacrum. Well, into that effect. It was um, in that flashback sequence with the um, also the Revenant Legion. Yeah, if I recall correctly. And speaking of the Siege of Terror, now that we've finished all the Siege of Terror stuff that's out, I can finally ask you this question that's been coming for a few episodes. How was Erda able to fight four greater demons without using the warp? Magic. <laughs> um... Oh, it's been a while since I actually read the Erda fight, so I can't actually remember the exact um, the exact wording. Um, but if I had to guess, because she is the second, she was the most second. No, but, but I can't bloody talk. Um, because she was the second most powerful perpetual after the Emperor himself, I imagine that her power came from a similar source to his, because his power was, you know, that of anathema. It's basically anathema to the Chaos Gods. So, yeah. I so considering that Erda, you know, was basically, you know, just behind the Emperor in terms of power, I imagine her power must have come from, like, a similar such source, if I had to guess. That makes sense. Except, uh... without, except without the whole, you know, by your... Millions of shaman souls combined. I am Captain Planet thing. Uh, yeah, yeah, that is uh, that is very daft. Uh, Emperor, he's a hero. Gonna take chaos down to zero. You'll <sighs> pay for this, anathema, kind of thing. God. Um, there you go. The Same for the point... anima- for the animatica sessions. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I hope we get those back someday. Yeah. Um, one more question regarding, well, actually, post heresy in this case with Marines. Uh, why didn't the Chaos Gods try to scatter the Primaris Marines like they did the Primarchs and all that? Like, why didn't the Chaos Gods do anything to stop it? Probably because it wasn't the Emperor working. It's just like, ah, screw it. <laughs> we followed the Emperor's plans. It's not going to do this. Who's this? That's Cyrus Cole. No one cares about him, kind of thing. I don't know. Um, it's. It's a bit less specific than the Marines, but when, when Gilliman comes back, it's like it's a blind spot in Zinch's plans. Oh, Like, yeah. when they talk about it in the um, the Rise of the Primarch like, source book, it's like, yeah, they never saw it coming, so maybe it's sort of like tangentially from that, because that was all bound up in, like, when I return, do this. Mm. So they probably just went, ah, no, it's not ever going to happen, kind of thing, and we just ignored it, because, like, no, no it's going to open the Primaris project, nah. It's been 10,000 years, no one's going to do it. What do you mean Gilliman's back? Okay. I mean, that's like saying no one's going to ever open Pandora's box. Like, it doesn't matter if it's never going to happen. You make sure it doesn't happen anyway. Yes, but, you know, the arrogance of divinity and all that. I mean... Just, I look, mean, with just the... look at God of War. Is that Yes, since we're making mention to it. Yes, absolutely. Uh <laughs> Okay, uh, this one's aimed at me, but I think we can ask all of us. Do you believe that Age of Sigmar will ever get a not-undead death faction? So, for example, Ooh. an army of mortals and necromancers who are very much alive and hoping to gain Nagash's favour and, for example, a better afterlife I and mean, not just be and stuff. A, 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 a death faction that isn't dead, isn't that what fleshy cortex aren't ghouls actually alive? They um, are. they are yes. There um, you go. <laughs> it, it is in this, but the thing is, the flesh eater courts are not. Ex- they're a death faction in that they work like death. They use death magic and the like. 
But there is still scope for this army that is being discussed in the comment because the Flesh Eater Courts are not exactly... What's the word I'm looking for? Loyal. Sane. Well, not saying either, but not exactly loyal. They're more used as chaffy meat shield distraction carnifexes by the Generals of Death who can sometimes command them a little bit. But ghouls are often seen as expendable things and well they become zombies when they're dead anyway because i'll just resurrect them as zombies so in all truth there is still scope for this army but what you'd often find is mortals living in shayish who pay fidelity to nagash you could easily represent as they a lot of them have their own gods had their own gods i should say yeah uh gods of death mm. people like morda for example uh, who is talked about in the uh tale of four warlords project for white dwarf a few months ago and so they would serve that god who may have been eaten by nagash or they would serve sigmar because their god was eaten by nagash and they want revenge kind of thing typically could be interesting hmm mm. um I saw something I liked and then I lost it again. Um, coming back to Space Marines, is it seen that promotion, that movement from a reserve company, say uh, the ninth company, to an assault company? No, is it the ninth? Anyway, is being moved from a reserve company to an assault company seen as a promotion? Like, do people look down on reserve companies inside chapters? I think this might be some that be you know a chapter by chapter ba- you know basis kind of thing. Mm. Like so, I think some chapters like with like the Ultramarines for example, I don't think they'd really care if you're assault or reserve. You're like, are you doing your job? Well, there you go. You know, then again, you compare to essentially like say you know, I don't know, Marines malevolent for instance. It was like, hey, you're just stuck in the reserve company. Fuck you, kind of thing. <laughs> I don't know. I, I think it would be on a chapter by chapter basis, personally. Yeah, yeah I, I think that's true. Uh, there was one on the previous episode, which I didn't ask because it was for you, and I just need to go and find it. Um, um, sometime back, Remley's mentioned a story where some thousand sons tried to revert Magnus from demonhood. What was it? Is that a story? Uh, off the hmm. top of my head, I don't actually recall that. Um, can I, like, like, can I mention makes... what, what episode I said that in? No, is it just some time back? Like, it makes me think of the reflection cracked, the uh, Emperor's Children, Thousand Sons, uh, not Thousand Sons, and Fulgrim story, where they tried to get Fulgrim back to normal, but I don't recognise this story at all. No. Yeah. Um, if the commenter could mention like where I mentioned this, like, it might jog my memory. Um, yeah. Okay. Off the top of my head, I, I, I don't know off the top of my head. Sorry. Okay. Uh, and another one, I always got the impression that you don't like Necrons, Remlade. Have any of the recent books changed your opinion on this? I'll be honest. And- I'll be honest. Necrons for me, well, following the post-Necron retcon, I just found them to be a very boring army, personally. I mean, mm-hmm. in terms of stories and that, Twice Dead King, great series. You know, I thought Twice Dead King was great. And The you Infinite know- and the Divine is also excellent, just Throwing it out there. I've not read that yet. And to be honest... It's hilarious. Read it. And to be honest, so I, I, I... I kind of have like reservation regarding to read now and purely because everyone keeps saying, you have to read, you have to read, and that's kind of putting me off. It's like, mm. yeah, everyone's been with so that's much bad. hype about it, and I'll be like, that's not that good kind of thing, you know? Um, if that makes sense. Read but, more in the museum, see how you feel. All right. Um... I mean, because personally, I always prefer. I mean, it's maybe just my nostalgia talking, but I preferred the take on the third edition Necrons, you know, basically being more of an eldritch horror. You're know, basically this silent, you know, an army of like just, well, effectively just undead skeletons, robots, you know, as opposed to just, you know, Tomb Kings in space. Um, mm. I know not a lot of people have I know some people prefer the post retcon Necrons as actually having more character. Fine, totally valid opinion. I and I'll be honest, like I did like that the Imperial Armor books did reference the old third edition Necrons with the Main Arc Dynasty because uh, mm-hmm. they basically were written more akin to the third edition Necrons, which I did appreciate. Um, 
but yeah, just Necrons for me, I, I just don't find them that interesting overall. Sorry. No, it's interesting because the Necrons origin story kind of is flipped on its head a little bit from third to fifth. Mm. Because third edition Necrons show don't make a deal with the devil type thing for this because they were uh sold out well were they even sold out to the katan or consumed by the katan and then worshiped them as gods enslaved to the winds of the katan uh Whereas, basically they struck a, yeah they struck a deal with the katan the katan ate their bodies not their souls the third edition codex makes that very clear um and basically like their souls were lost to the ether and basically you're now immortal you have no personality, you have no consciousness, you're just a mindless drone. Yeah, don't make a deal with the devil. Yeah. But the modern Necrons are still don't make a deal with the devil, but also the Catan were not necessarily malevolent in the f- in first place. It was don't go making your own devils because they will destroy you. And then they destroyed them back, entirely defeating the point of the coal point. I... I will say this about the uh, post retcon Necrons, but for one thing I do appreciate, and that's basically the introduction of the Catan Shards, because considering that in third edition the Catan, you know, the, model, the Catan models were whole Catan, but they were as weak as a paper towel, you know. Yeah. So it's like for, for an actual god, it's like, hey, it's it's an actual living god that can be taken out by a lucky grot. You know, I appreciate the fact that them changing it to shards, like. These are fragments of a god, so while powerful, they're not as powerful as a whole god. It's like, thank you, I appreciate that, because they were crap on the tabletop. Yeah, but they should have been on... If you're going to do that, you could actually fuse the two together by having the Necron still be enslaved, but have the Catan be shattered by the war in heaven. So when the war in heaven happened, yes, they won, but look what it cost them. It cost them themselves being destroyed in the effort of destroying the old ones, but they lived on as their fragments that became revered in a sort of twisted, perverse reflection of the shards of Cain with the avatars. Do you know what's quite funny, though? Um, following the Necron retcon, that basically meant that a good chunk of the novel Mechanicum is now non-canon. Because it was de- so true. Because it was dealing with, like, oh, yeah, um, these these beings, they... F- you know, they fled and hid themselves away, which is in keeping with the old third edition Catan law. They basically hid themselves away until the galaxy rejuvenated itself. And it's like, yeah, that didn't happen now. <laughs> no, no, it didn't. They were shattered and buried. Yeah, I don't know if you have a particular thought on it, Mark. I know um, you haven't written a huge amount or maybe with the Necrons yet, but I don't know if you have a particular take on them that you prefer uh, if you were around hobbying back then? I, I've got the third edition Necron Codex and I loved it um, when it was out and I did feel quite... I was like, oh, no. But as time has went on, I've kind of I've made my peace with it and also, like, I, I do like a lot of the characters and concepts that they did introduce with the, the retcon, but I think parts of it were already there because there's a really good example in... Did you read Xenology? Yeah. Yeah, and that, you've got the one at the end, and it's like, you know, some of us are still able to think, you know, the lords and ladies of our kind. Mm. The one that's, you know, in disguise. And I just like that. I like that there was a bit of, of like, nuance. And I do like that, as you said, in the the current one, they've got, you know, a few, um, like, tomb worlds that are wiped. And so they still have that kind of implacable horror attitude. Mm. But yeah, I, think, I, can, I can see it from both sides. Yeah, to be fair, though, the Necrons have been rewritten twice. They went from Chaos Androids, lest we forget, to oh. uh, to the Killbots, to the Killbots that uh, overthrew their own gods. I think, with for, for me, because someone, there's a follow-up question in the comment asking, what changes would you do to make them more interesting? Um, I think we could sort of revert back a little bit in that still have the characters and the personalities Mm. like the silent king we can still use the silent king in a non-sentient necron way by having a few who were retained exactly as they did in the fifth edition retcon by having the lords and ladies um and the kings and the advisors be still sane but 
whilst not destroying the Catan because it makes it seem like the Necrons have gone from an eldritch horror we cannot understand because they we do not understand their motives to they are so ungodly powerful they can blow up a god and enslave it and yet they just seem entirely mired in their own we're too busy being weird to actually kill everything but we could if we wanted to the only reason we have it is because we've got buggy code it's like and and they're running all those plays that last for decades. And that, absolutely. I just think you could easily have the Necrons be still wiped and subservient to the Catan, who were shattered by the war in heaven, and gradually rebuilding their strength and bringing the Necrons back online, and have it as another, it is only a matter of time because before they become so numerous and so powerful that the galaxy will surely be eradicated, as a natural antithesis to the Tyranids, which is what they are clearly set up to be now with the Silent King being so anti-Tyranid, that those two are sort of antithesis to one another, the biological apocalypse versus the bionicle apocalypse. And I know bionicle is not a word aside <laughs> from the toys, but you know what I mean? Like A whole bunch the, of like Krakatoas going on or whatever they come. Uh, but you know what I mean? Fire Krakatoa they're, they're, comes. Like... I've probably completely changed my tune from a previous episode where I thought Tyranids and Necrons were too similar. But you can easily set them up as the Tyranids are the eldritch cosmic horror we do not understand to the Necrons being an apocalypse of the galaxy's own making that de destroyed in its own hubris and mm -hmm. now is left only to destroy at the whims of the laughing, thirsting gods, you know, like the front cover of Inside Blurb of every 40k rulebook since Day Dot. Mm. I think you could still have the Catan be in charge, but shattered without, because it makes the Necrons seem too all powerful and only failing because they're derping and buggy, if you know what I mean. Mm. Yeah. I don't know, just a random using for a question that wasn't even meant for me. <laughs> <laughs> and given the time, I believe that will come to the end of this episode. So, thank you very much to everyone who tuned into this episode. We apologise for all the tangents, except we don't. We don't. Uh, <laughs> and thank you to Mark Collins for joining us this episode. Yeah, absolute pleasure. Yeah, thank well, you for coming on. It's always a pleasure to work with someone and talk to someone from the Black Library and get a little peek behind the door. Well, it's been really great. Thanks, guys. You're welcome. No problem. So, until next time, this has been Remlay from 40k Theories. This has been Neve from Tactica Imperialis. And I'm Mark Collins. And we'll see you again next time. Bye-bye.